Chapter 8 The Ideal of Karma Yoga Part 1 The grandest idea in the religion of the Vedanta is that we may reach the same goal by different paths and these paths I have generalized into four those of work, love, psychology and knowledge but you must at the same time remember that these divisions are not very marked and quite exclusive of each other. Each blends into the other, but according to the type which prevails, we name the divisions. It is not that you can find men who have no other faculty than that of work, nor that you can find men who are no more than devoted worshippers only, nor that there are men who have no more than mere knowledge. These divisions are made in accordance with the type or the tendency that may be seen to prevail in a man. We have found that, in the end, all these four paths converge and become one. All religions and all methods of work and worship lead us to one and the same goal. I have already tried to point out that goal. It is freedom as I understand it. Everything that we perceive around us is struggling towards freedom from the atom to the man, from the insentient, lifeless particle of matter to the highest existence on earth, the human soul. The whole universe is, in fact, the result of this struggle for freedom. In all combinations, every particle is trying to go on its own way, to fly from the other particles, but the others are holding it in check. Our earth is trying to fly away from the sun and the moon from the earth. Everything has a tendency to infinite dispersion. All that we see in the universe has for its basis this one struggle towards freedom. It is under the impulse of this tendency that the saint prays and the robber robs. When the line of action taken is not a proper one, we call it evil. And when the manifestation of it is proper and high, we call it good. But the impulse is the same, the struggle towards freedom. The saint is oppressed with the knowledge of this condition of bondage and he wants to get rid of it, so he worships God. The thief is oppressed with the idea that he does not possess certain things and he tries to get rid of that want to obtain freedom from it, so he steals. Freedom is one goal of all nature, sentient or insentient, and consciously or unconsciously, everything is struggling towards that goal. The freedom which the saint seeks is very different from that which the robber seeks. The freedom loved by the saint leads him to the enjoyment of infinite, unspeakable bliss, while that on which the robber has set his heart only forges other bonds for his soul. There is to be found in every religion the manifestation of this struggle towards freedom. It is the groundwork of all morality, of unselfishness, which means getting rid of the idea that men are the same as their little body. When we see a man doing good work, helping others, it means that he cannot be confined within the limited circle of me and mine. There is no limit to this getting out of selfishness. All the great systems of ethics preach absolute unselfishness as the goal. Supposing this absolute unselfishness can be reached by a man, what becomes of him? He is no more the little Mr. So-and-so. He has acquired infinite expansion. The little personality which he had before is now lost to him forever. He has become infinite and the attainment of this infinite expansion is indeed the goal of all religions and of all moral and philosophical teachings. The personalist when he hears the idea philosophically puts get frightened. At the same time, if he preaches morality, he, after all, teaches the very same idea himself. He puts no limit to the unselfishness of man. Suppose a man becomes perfectly unselfish under the personalistic system, how are we to distinguish him from the perfected ones in other systems? He has become one with the universe and to become that is the goal of all. Only the poor personalist has not the courage to follow out his own reasoning to its right conclusion. Karma Yoga is the attaining through unselfish work of that freedom which is the goal of all human nature. Every selfish action therefore retards our reaching the goal and every unselfish action takes us towards the goal.
That is why the only definition that can be given of morality is this, that which is selfish is immoral and that which is unselfish is moral. But if you come to details, the matter will not be seen to be quite so simple. For instance, environment often makes the details different as I have already mentioned. The same action under one set of circumstances may be unselfish and under another quite selfish. So we can give only a general definition and leave the details to be worked out by taking into consideration the differences in time, place and circumstances. In one country, one kind of conduct is considered moral and in another the very same is immoral because the circumstances differ. The goal of all nature is freedom and freedom is to be attained only by perfect unselfishness. Every thought, word or deed that is unselfish takes us towards the goal and as such is called moral. That definition you will find holds good in every religion and every system of ethics. In some systems of thought, morality is derived from a superior being, God. If you ask why a man ought to do this and not that, their answer is, because such is the command of God. But whatever be the source from which it is derived, their code of ethics also has the same central idea, not to think of self but to give up self. And yet some persons, in spite of this high ethical idea, are frightened at the thought of having to give up their little personalities. We may ask the man who clings to the idea of little personalities to consider the case of a person who has become perfectly unselfish, who has no thought for himself, who has no deed for himself, who speaks no word for himself, and then say where his himself is. That himself is known to him only so long as he thinks, acts, or speaks for himself. If he is only conscious of others, of the universe, and of the all, where is his himself? It is gone forever. Karma Yoga, therefore, is a system of ethics and religion intended to attain freedom through unselfishness and by good works. The Karma Yogi need not believe in any doctrine whatsoever. He may not believe even in God, may not ask what his soul is, nor think of any metaphysical speculation. He has got his own special aim of realizing selflessness, and he has to work it out himself. Every moment of his life must be realization because he has to solve by mere work without the help of doctrine or theory the very same problem to which the Janani applies his reason and inspiration and the Bhakta his love. Now comes the next question. What is that work? What is this doing good to the world? Can we do good to the world? In an absolute sense, no. In a relative sense, yes. No permanent or everlasting good can be done to the world. If it could be done, the world would not be this world. We may satisfy the hunger of a man for five minutes, but he will be hungry again. Every pleasure with which we supply a man may be seen to be momentary. No one can permanently cure this ever-recurring fever of pleasure and pain. Can any permanent happiness be given to the world? In the ocean, we cannot raise a wave without causing a hollow somewhere else. The sum total of the good things in the world has been the same throughout in its relation to man's need and greed. It cannot be increased or decreased. Take the history of the human race as we know it today. Do we not find the same miseries and the same happiness, the same pleasures and pains, the same differences in position? Are not some rich, some poor, some high, some low, some healthy, some unhealthy? All this was just the same with the Egyptians, Greeks and the Romans in ancient times as it is with Americans today. So far as history is known, it has always been the same, yet at the same time we find that, running along with all these incurable differences of pleasure and pain, there has ever been the struggle to alleviate them. Every period of history has given birth to thousands of men and women who have worked hard to smooth the passage of life for others and how far have they succeeded. We can only play at driving the ball from one place to another. We take away pain from the physical plane and it goes to the mental one. It is like that picture in Dante's Hell where the misers were given a mass of gold to roll up the hill. Every time they rolled it up a little, it rolled down again. All our talks about the millennium are very nice as schoolboy stories, 
but they are not no, but they are no better than that all nations that dream of the millennium also think that of all people in the world they will have the best of it then for themselves this is a wonderfully unselfish idea of the millennium we cannot add happiness to this world similarly we cannot add pain to it either the sum total of the energies of pleasure and pain displayed here on earth will be the same throughout we just push it from this side to the other side and from that side to this but it will remain the same because to remain so it is its very nature this ebb and flow this rising and falling is in the world's very nature it would be as logical to hold otherwise as to say that we may have life without death this is complete nonsense because the very idea of life implies death and the very idea of pleasure implies pain the lamp is constantly burning out and that is its life If you want to have life you have to die every moment for it life and death are only different expressions of the same thing looked at from different standpoints they are the falling and the rising of the same wave and the two form one whole one looks at the fall side and becomes the pessimist pessimist and another looks at the rise side and becomes an optimist when a boy is going to school and his father and mother are taking care of him everything seems blessed to him he wa- his wants are simple he is a great optimist but the old man with his varied experience becomes calmer and is sure to have his warmth considerably cool down so old nations with signs of decay all around them are apt to be less hopeful than new nations there is a proverb in india a thousand years a city and a thousand years a forest this change of city into forest and vice versa is going on everywhere and it makes people optimists or pessimists according to the side they see of it